Now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Fibber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Bobby Ellis stars as Henry Aldrich in an episode of The Aldrich Family. This goes back 70 years, February 21st, 1952, as Henry joins the debate team. Thursday, meet the new Plymouth. Thursday, enter the big Plymouth contest. But right now, Plymouth presents... Henry! Henry Aldrich! Coming, Mother. Yes, it's the Aldrich family. Written by Clifford Goldsmith. Transcribed and brought to your family by Plymouth. (laughs) Families today are pretty much the same as families yesterday. Fathers and mothers and children never change very much from one generation to another. And the ever-present spark plug is always a typical teenage boy like Henry Aldrich. The scene is the Aldrich dining room. The time is morning. Could you please pass the toast, Mary? Another piece, Henry. Yes, please. And Father? Well? Can I please have another egg? Dear, that'll make three eggs. Yes, Mother. Henry, your normal appetite is rather frightening, but now you're eating like a man with a purpose. Gee whiz, I do have a purpose, Father. I'm building myself up. I'm on the debating team. You're on the debating team, dear? Well, I'm not exactly on it, Mother. I'm really just trying out for it. They're having the trials this afternoon. How did you happen to go out for debating, Henry? Well, it's... It's just sort of the kind of thing that appeals to me. Mother, would it be too much trouble to open a can of sardines? Sardines for breakfast? Well, everyone says that fish is brain food. Isn't that so, Father? Oh, I don't know. It didn't keep them from getting caught. (laughs) <laughs> Aren't you going to finish your toast, Mary? Here, you can have it Thanks, and will you please pass the marmalade? How much do you have to weigh to make the debating team? Well, I don't have to weigh anything But I don't see any point in going to a thing half-heartedly Well, dear, if you do make the team, I hope Aunt Harriet will come to hear you speak She just won't believe her ears Well, gee whiz, why should everybody be so amazed just because I'm anxious to improve my mind? I think everybody ought to improve their mind No sense in overdoing it, though Oh, I won't go overboard, Father. (laughs) On which side of the debate are you speaking? On which side? You have two sides, haven't you? Father, they don't even have a team yet. Do you really think you can make the team, dear? I hope so, Mother. I'd hate to be doing all this eating for nothing. Oh, I don't think it'll be entirely wasted. Oh, would you excuse me, please, while I run upstairs and get some notes I've got to use? Yes, dear. Sam, I'm simply delighted. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if Henry made a good debater. He's sort of a chip off the old block. He has a quick mind. Thinks fast on his feet. Who do you suppose that is, Mother? Don't bother to come to the door, anybody. Is Henry through eating? Well, hello, Willie. Henry will be down in just a minute. How does he feel this morning, Mrs. Aldrich? Is he a little nervous? Why should he be nervous? Well, you know, trying out for the debating team. It can be pretty nerve-wracking. Henry didn't act like he was nervous. He didn't eat like it either. Are you going to try out for the team, Willie? Oh, no. I'm on it. How many eggs do you eat a day? Eggs? Yes, to keep yourself in good condition for debating. Oh, I'm not on the talking end of the team. On which end are you? I'm the manager. What I really went out for was the track team, but my legs went back on me. (laughs) What are the duties of a manager? Well, for one thing, I correspond. You correspond with whom? With all the other managers. We get together and correspond. Sort of write letters, you know. Oh, yeah. That's quite an accomplishment. I'm sure you do it very well, Willie. Yes, ma'am. I worry about it quite a lot. And you persuaded Henry to go out for the debating team? Oh, no, sir. That was on account of Ellen. Ellen? Yes, sir. Ellen Standish. What does she have to do with it? She's very pretty. And she's also on the team. I know who she is. Mother, she's that girl that can talk your head off. That's the one. Ellen Standish? She's very pretty, though. But she is the one that talks a lot. Sure. To everyone except Henry. And he figured that if he could get on the team, she'd talk to him. Well, that explains Henry's sudden craving for the finer things. Yes, sir. But she's pretty, Mr. Ulrich. It's been a great pleasure for me just a manager. 
I just finished my tryout for the debating team. Oh, did you? Sure. I thought perhaps you'd be glad to know I may be on the team with you. Are you going down the hall a ways? I'm going into the library here. Oh. Say, Henry, is that you? What is it, Homer? Hello, Ellen. I just finished my tryout. Are you going out for the team, too? Sure. We'll all be together. Oh. Uh, goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, Ellen. Ellen? Henry, they said you and I should wait in the classroom across the hall until the tryouts are all over. Okay, let's go in. Boy, I sure hope I make the team. Well, what subject did you talk about? We talked about how I helped my mother grow tomatoes last summer. Henry, it isn't pronounced tomato. It isn't? No. In parliamentary procedure, it's tomato. Tomato? Well, who do you know that calls it tomato? Did you ever hear anybody talk about French fried potatoes? (laughs) That isn't the point, Henry. Common people call it tomato. But when you're trying to make the debating team, it's tomato. Hey, fellas, I got some great news for you. You have, Willie? Did we make the team? The faculty is in conference right now. I'll let you know as soon as they tell me. Hey, Willie, Willie. What were you going to ask him, Henry? Whether I could give part of my speech over. As a matter of fact, Homer, I know a lot of people who aren't common who say tomato. Well, Henry, all I know is that if I had to stand up before three members of the faculty, I'd be mighty sure I said tomato. Boy... The part that makes me mad, Homer, is I could have just as well said asparagus and been on safe ground. Hey, fellas, the meeting's over. What did they decide, Willie? Yeah, what? Well, one of you guys is going to be awfully disappointed. We are? Well, tell us which one it is. Now, listen, Henry, I'm the manager, and I'll make the announcement when I'm good and ready. Besides, it shouldn't make any difference to you how they decide it. You mean I didn't make it? No. They liked Homer's voice better. They did? No kidding. Sure, it carries father. They say they can hear your voice even in the last row of the balcony. Lucy Adams also made the team. Well, i got to go back and attend to some correspondence. Gee, Henry, I'm sorry. Oh, gee, there's nothing to be sorry about, Homer. If you want to know the truth, I'm glad I didn't make it. With Lucy Adams on it and everything. Ellen Standish is on it. You know, Homer, we've been friends for a long time, haven't we? Sure. Well, I was just thinking. You've done a lot of nice things for me... So I'm going to do you a favor. You are? Sure. I'm willing to take your place on the team, just out of friendship, and I won't charge you a cent. Why? Well, don't you want to get off the team? When did I say that? Well, I shouldn't think you'd want to be on it. Hey, Henry, what do you think? What, Willie? You made the team. And I didn't? No, you're on it too, Homer. I am? Henry, that gets rid of Lucy Adams. No, it doesn't. She's on the team too. Well, whose place do I take? Ellen Stanish's. Ellen's? Ellen's? Yes, she just resigned. There, Homer, now do you see what you've done? It isn't Homer's fault. Ellen says she's entirely too nervous to debate. Hello, Henry, congratulations. Oh, hello, Lucy. Isn't it wonderful? Henry, I'm going home. But, Homer, haven't you heard? Lucy, you don't think debating is going to make you nervous, do you? Oh, no, I feel wonderful. I think I'll resign. Henry, you aren't going to resign just as we've got our first debate scheduled, are you? For when, Willie? Didn't you know? For a week from next Friday night. I've been corresponding about it since last August. Who are we debating with? Middletown High School. The subject is resolved. That the steam engine has contributed more to the progress of civilization than the horse. Well, on which side are we? The horses. We take the negative? (laughs) Sure. We don't believe in steam engines. Don't you think the horse has done more than the steam engine? I don't know, Lucy. Henry, you don't seem interested. Lucy, I just don't think I'm going to be any good at this. If I can't convince myself, how am I going to convince a whole auditorium full of people? But that's the way I felt at first. Here, we have a cookie my mother baked. No, thank you. They have fudge fillings. Fudge fillings? Well, I'll try just half of one. Here. Think of what the horse has done for agriculture, Henry. Sixty percent of the farms in this country still use horses. Is that right? May I have the other half of that cookie? Sure, here. And Henry, how did the covered wagons cross the plains? By horse? By horse. Our forefathers didn't know what a steam engine was. That's true, Lucy. And you always have cookies like this? Oh, of course. See how interesting it is? Well, it's beginning to show some possibilities. Mm -hmm. Excuse me for reaching in front of you. When you get through with those cookies, Henry, there are some more in the kitchen. 
Oh, my goodness. I wonder where that's Willie phone is. Willie? Hello? Hello, Lucy. Oh, is that you, Homer? Yes. Is Henry there? Henry. Gee whiz, what does Homer want? Here. Oh, Homer. Can't you get away from her, Henry? Not exactly. Boy, do I pity you. Do you know what I dug up in the library this afternoon? What? All about the Eohippus. The what of us? The Eohippus. It was a prehistoric horse, and it stood less than two feet high. What was it used for? I don't think it was used for anything. But I think we ought to mention it, Henry. It'll show we dug into it. They had four toes. Four? Imagine. Henry, will you have another cookie? Sure, thanks, Lucy. Cookie? Uh, Homer, did you ever think of this? How do they speak of a steam engine? How? By its horsepower. Sure. Boy, Henry, that's wonderful. Write it down, Lucy. And I'll write down about the u hippos. Sure. <laughs> Chairman, honorable judges, worthy opponents. The subject we've been asked to discuss this evening is Rizal. Henry, do you have to wave your arms? Was I waving my arms, Father? Go on. When we are through, ladies and gentlemen, it will be clearly seen that the horse is one animal that cannot be replaced. What time does the debate begin this evening? At 8.15. And boy, Father, we're a cinch to win. Where was I? Hey, the horse is an animal that cannot be replaced. Oh, yeah. What are steam engines made of, ladies and gentlemen? Of steel and iron and steel and coal. And, and how do they first get them out of the mines? I'll tell you how. It'll be a pleasure. Buy a horse. Father, don't you think that's going to knock him for a loop? I'm afraid it will. <laughs> <laughs> I prepared this whole thing in a week. And what makes pulleys go round? Belts. And what are belts made of? From horses' hides. And what was the first machine ever made? A cart. And what pulled the cart? A horse. And how about Paul Revere? It's common gossip, known by every school child, how he saved America with a horse. And then, Father, I go on and I end up with a long speech about the Eohippus. The Eohippus? Yes, sir. It was a prehistoric horse that hardly came up to my knees. Don't you think it's pretty good? Well, it has one or two weak points, Henry. Yeah, but, Father, what you've heard is only one-third of our argument. We've divided it into three parts. I cover the horse as a historical contribution, Homer covers it during the present, and Lucy covers it from the female point of view. Henry, I've just pressed your blue serge suit for you. Thank you, Mother. And when you get up on the platform, don't turn your back to the audience. Why not, Mother? And the seat is shiny. <laughs> Henry, do you mind if I raise one or two questions? You mean there's something about my speech that puzzles you? Well, in the first place, iron is not hauled out of mines by horses, but by mules. Well, 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 Father, I don't like to argue, but when you get right down to it, a mule is sort of a horse. A mule is a mule. I could show you a book that says a mule is a horse. I'd like to see it. Well, anyway, I, I don't think that's the point, Father. The question is, which has done more for civilization? Well, supposing your worthy opponents remind your audience that the first cart was not pulled by a horse, but by a man. No horse? No horse. Not even a neo hippus? No, sir. And supposing they mention the fact that very good driving belts are made not only from horse hide, but from cow hide. But, Father, you keep, you keep evading the issue. What I'm talking about is horses. All right, then, let's talk about them. In what way did Paul Revere's horse help promote progress? Well, it stands to reason. If he hadn't had a horse, he wouldn't have been able to spread the alarm before the enemy came. Supposing he had to wait around until the steam engine was invented. And by what means was the enemy approaching? On horseback. In other words, it was a case of one horse trying to get away from a number of other horses. Therefore, the horses all cancel each other out and have nothing to do with the case. Could you say that again, Father? <laughs> Make it a little clearer. I'm a lawyer. I don't have to be clear. <laughs> Henry! Yes, Mother? It's time for you to go upstairs and watch. Already? Yes, dear. Dinner's on the table. Dinner? Well, gee, Mother, it's a funny thing, but all of a sudden something happened to my stomach. Well, what's the matter, dear? Have you lost your confidence? I just wish I hadn't gotten mixed up in this darn debate. Now, dear, you go upstairs and get washed. You'll feel better. Yes, Mother. You and Father aren't going to sit down in front, are you? We are. Well, don't do that, Father. Every time I see your face, I'll forget all about horses. Henry, please go upstairs. Yes, Mother. I feel just as though I were sitting on the guillotine. Sam, 
Did I overhear you criticizing Henry's talk? I, I was simply pointing out one or two of his weak spots. There's nothing wrong with that. Oh, my goodness, Sam. Now he'll just brood about it. You know how Henry is. I'll answer the phone. Maybe the debate's being called off. There, Sam, is a very good example of how you've unnerved him. Alice, I give you my word. I was simply trying to help the boy. Well, I'm quite sure that if I had to stand up before an audience of several hundred people, I wouldn't want my father to upset me just before I went on. Henry! Yes, Father? When you're through on the phone, come in here. Yes, sir. Sam, you're going to wear your best suit, aren't you? Just to go over to the high school? Well, dear, I bought a new hat. After all, we don't want to be a disgrace to Henry. And I do want Henry to win, if only because of that Ellen Standish. What has she done? Well, Mary heard that Ellen got off the team just because Henry was on it. She whiz, is Lucy nervous? Poor kid. Well, don't you be nervous, Henry. Your father and I are trying not to be. What did Lucy call you about? Just to say she's so scared she can't eat her dinner. Well, you should have told her to have a cup of tea. That's all I'm going to have. <laughs> Henry. I'm going up and finish washing. Oh, uh, before you go up. Is there uh, something more wrong with my speech? Well, I'd like to explain that the only reason I criticized your talk was to find out how much you believed in it. Oh. You see, if you don't believe with all your heart and soul that the horse has been more important, then the judges won't believe you. Oh, but I do believe it, Father. Well, I suppose I'm a little sentimental about it. But it isn't just for my sake and for yours that I want to win. It's really for all horses in general. <laughs> Henry, can I speak to you for a minute? Where did you come from, Willie? I just met the Middletown debating team at the station. And boy, have they made a mess of things. How? Well, we're taking the negative of the argument, aren't we? Yeah. Well, so are they. You mean they've taken our side? Yes. Can you imagine a dirty trick like that? How could a thing like that have happened? Well, something seems to have gone wrong with the correspondence. <laughs> <laughs> Willie, you mean it was really your fault? Henry, I'd like you to see all the correspondence I've handled on this. I bet you'd make one or two minor mistakes yourself. What are you going to do about it? Well, Mr. Bradley, our principal, says our team has to take the other side. The other side? Willie, you mean I have to be a traitor to the horse? <laughs> We'll return to the Aldrich family in just a moment. February 21st, 1952, The Aldrich Family on Classic Radio Theater. Here's some great news. If you missed the deadline to sign up for health insurance, or if you just have a plan you're not happy with, you still have a choice. It's called MediShare. There are hundreds of thousands of members, and they love it. MediShare has a 98% customer satisfaction rating, and this is obviously huge. The typical family saves around $6,000 a year switching to MediShare. Find out more. They're great to talk to. 833-34-BIBLE. That's 833-34-BIBLE. The MyPillow.com clearance continues. Roll and go anywhere. MyPillow's $9.99. The Body Pillow, $39.99. And MyPillow bath sheets on sale, 50% off. Use my promo code USA. Go to MyPillow.com slash radio specials. You'll also get a free copy of Mike Lindell's book. MyPillow.com slash radio specials. Use promo code USA or 1-800-951-8175. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, February 21st, 1952, The Aldrich Family. And now getting back to the troubles of Henry Aldrich. Well, after working on a debate for ten days, Henry has just learned that his team has been preparing the wrong side. The scene opens in the high school principal's office. The time is that same evening. But, Mr. Bradley, it isn't fair to the team. It isn't even fair to the audience. Henry, the mistake was made by our manager. The least we can do is take the affirmative and go ahead with the debate. But in the meantime, how about the horse? I think the horse will understand. But, Mr. Bradley, we memorized their speeches word for word. I've even learned a whole eulogy to the horse. I can't just give the whole thing and insert the word steam engine instead of horse, can I? Henry, why do we have debates? Well... In order to develop our faculties for thinking and reasoning. Don't you see, Mr. Bradley, I'm no good at a thing like that. I can't argue. We're doing a pretty good job of it right now. But I'm losing. Yes. (laughs) But you're developing your faculties. Come in. Mr. Bradley, is Henry in here? Yes, Lucy. Well, look, Henry, could we ask Mr. Bradley to do this? To do what? Why don't both teams agree right at the start that the horse has made the greatest contribution to civilization and then let the judges decide which team is the most sincere? 
Sure, Mr. Bradley, that would be interesting. No. The Middletown team are our guests, and the least we can do is have a difference of opinion with them. Yes? Mr. Bradley, is the school nurse here? What's the matter, Homer? Well, it's a funny thing, but I have chills and a headache. Chills and a headache? Yes, sir, and my jaws hurt. I think I'm coming down with the mumps. Didn't you have the mumps last fall, Homer? But, Mr. Bradley, I've just been talking with the Middletown team. They don't feel half as keen about the horse as we do. Why don't we be generous and give them the steam engine? Henry and Homer, you have exactly 30 minutes in which to prepare your arguments. Middletown will take the negative. And if Centerville is half the high school, I think it is, we shall take the affirmative. What is more, ladies and gentlemen, members of the faculty... Since the Centerville team has just learned at the last moment that it must change sides, it will, so to speak, be swapping horses in the middle of the stream in favor of the steam engine. (laughs) (laughs) And I suppose that the pitcher of water that rests on this stand is for the affirmative to make... February 21st, 1952, Bobby Ellis as Henry Aldrich, The Aldrich Family, here on Classic Radio Theater. The conclusion follows these important words. Are you in bad pain? You know what I mean. Your knees hurt. Your shoulder hurts. Your elbow and back are constantly killing you. And I'm sure you've tried every pain pill or cream available at the drugstore. Am I right? Well, here's something you haven't tried. Pain Magic. Pain Magic is not available at any drugstore. The only place you can get it is by calling the special toll-free number I'm about to give you. And to make things even better, call right now and find out about our buy one, get one free offer. We're so confident it'll work for you that we offer a free bottle with your purchase. No prescription required. Call now to learn how you can get Pain Magic and get rid of your pain. Remember, your results may vary. 800-492-8164. 800-492-8164. 800-492-8164. That's 800-492-8164. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, the conclusion of the Aldrich family, February 21st, 1952. Steve with and for the negative to give to their horses. (laughs) 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 As the first speaker for the negative, I mean the affirmative, by, uh, yes, the affirmative is uh, Homer Brown. The question we have been asked to discuss was, oh boy, I I mean, ladies and gentlemen and honorable judges. (laughs) Speaking of man's best friend, the horse, uh, the steam engine, instead of boring you for my full six minutes, I believe I can prove my point in practically less than a minute. Ladies and gentlemen, when a lady who lives in Chicago sees a hat that she wants in New York, how do they get it to her? By horseback? No! The next point I wish to bring to your attention is that little run of a beast, the Eohippus, that was never good for anything at all. Ladies and gentlemen, you have heard both sides of the argument and the rebuttal for the negative. The Centerville team did not utilize all of its original time, and I do not know whether any of its members would care to take part in the rebuttal. If so, we will now hear from Henry Aldrich. Mr. Chairman, Centerville High School has several things to say. My worthy opponents have tried to impress on you that if it weren't for the horse, we wouldn't have any steel or iron with which to build steam engines. May I ask, were they ever got any such idea as that? 
Horses aren't used in mines. Mules are. The next point. My worthy opponent says that the first cart was pulled by a horse. For his information, a man pulled the first cart. And now they're glad to ride in steam engines and relax. And how did the Middletown team get here this evening? By another steam engine. <laughs> and another point. My opponents would have you believe that if it hadn't been for Paul Revere's horse, we wouldn't be here in this happy, carefree land. But what was Paul Revere's horse trying to get away from? More horses. It was horses, ladies and gentlemen, that was causing all the trouble. And I ask you, is that what you could call progress? No. No, a thousand times no. The affirmative rest. Ladies and gentlemen, while the judges retire to try to reach their decision, a very difficult decision, I'm sure, the orchestra will entertain us with a number which they had rehearsed before they discovered their own team was to take the affirmative. It is called Light Cavalry Overture. <laughs> Judges reached the decision yet? I think they're coming on stage right now. You think Henry won? I don't know, Al. Well, I thought he talked beautifully, and he certainly looked better than any of the boys on the Middletown team. Ladies and gentlemen. Shh, quiet, Alice. Mr. Bradley is going to announce the decision. After careful consideration, the judges have voted unanimously in favor of the negative. Which side is the negative, Sam? Middletown. You mean Henry Laws? He did. I should like to congratulate not only the winners, but our team as well. In spite of the fact that we lost, never have I heard finer examples of extemporaneous speaking. If I hadn't known to the contrary, I would have said that the last speaker, Henry Aldrich, had prepared his rebuttal in advance. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, Mr. Fontaine. <clears throat> I happen to be one of the judges. Uh, may I ask... Was the negative Middletown? Uh, the negative was Middletown. Well, uh, the manager who gave us our slips of paper to mark the verdict on apparently got things twisted. Regardless of which side they had, the decision went to Centerville. Sam, Sam, we want to shake Henry's hand. I just wish that Ellen Standish's mother could have been here tonight. Hello, Mother. How are you? Oh, Henry, let me shake your hand. She wish it was because of you, Father, that we got the decision. Well, I was worried for a few minutes, though. I was afraid Middletown would mention the fact that most of the British troops were not on horseback, but on foot. You mean they weren't on horseback? Not so far as I know. <laughs> well, gee whiz. Sam, have you seen the morning paper? No, Alice. What's the news? Listen to this. Before a capacity audience last night, Centerville High School defended the negative side of a heated battle in which they were particularly effective in arguing for the affirmative. Henry Aldridge kept the visiting opponents completely baffled to the very end as to whether he favored the colonists or the British. <laughs> Henry, is that you in the kitchen? Yes, Father. Henry, are you eating more cookies after cleaning out the cookie jar at Lucy's house? Well, gosh, Father, a fella gets hungry all over again after walking home. Now, Henry? No wonder I'm always hungry. All I ever do is walk. Walk here, walk there. If there's a hidden meaning to this walkie-talkie conversation, please bring it out in the open, because I'm going to bed. Hidden meaning, Father? I think the last time you acquainted me with your walking expeditions... It ended with a sales talk to buy you a car. Oh, you won't have to buy this one, Father. It's free. A Plymouth convertible. First prize in the big Plymouth contest. Well, if I wasn't too young, I'd enter myself. But I figure with my help, you'd be a cinch to win. Oh, please, Henry, not tonight. I'm a bit tired. Oh, not tonight, Father. The contest doesn't start till Thursday. That's when the new Plymouth comes out. All right. Remind me Thursday, and we'll go down and see the new Plymouth. Now, will you get up to bed? Yes, Father. Just as soon as I finish these cookies. Boy. A new Plymouth convertible. The Aldrich Family is transcribed as written by Clifford Goldsmith. 
Henry is played by Bobby Ellis and Homer by Jack Grimes. Mr. and Mrs. Aldridge are House Jameson and Catherine Roth. Your announcer is Dick Dudley. Good night, everybody. And remember, you have an important date Thursday to meet the new 53 Plymouth. February 21st, 1952, The Aldrich Family on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. No offense, but are you a little fat when you look in the mirror? How would you like to learn the secrets to lose three to five pounds a week easily without joining the gym or going through any crazy diets? It's called Body Sculpt by Med Diet. For the last two decades, we've been helping people just like you that have pounds they want to shed. We've helped millions of people lose thousands and thousands of pounds over the years. And now it's your turn. Learn the secrets of how to lose weight with one simple phone call. You'll see an amazing difference in a matter of days. Don't believe us. We'll offer you a money-back guarantee. If you're ready to start losing weight right now, call right now to learn more about your risk-free order to Body Sculpt. Call for your risk-free offer. 800-738-5332, 800-738-5332, 800-738-5332, 800-738-5332, that's 800-738-5332. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, Part 2 of the five-part Yours Truly Johnny Dollar Story, The Bennett Matter, February 21st, 1956. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Billy Underwood, Johnny. They're trying to get you all over town. The hotel said to call you at this Skyline number. I'm out at Arnold Bennett's house. He's been shot. What? That's right. Well, who shot him? Don't know yet. I think I'm a transfusion here before they take him to the hospital. Uh-huh. Look, Johnny, I got something to show you. Yeah, what? Some ashes we just analyzed. The Bennett building was fired by a pro. He used celluloid and a wick made out of paraffin. I can prove it. I hope Bennett lives to hear that. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Four State Fire Insurance Corporation, 4065 Spear Boulevard, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Bennett arson fraud. Arnold Bennett was removed to the hospital where he was given a 50-50 chance of recovering from a 38 slug that had entered his chest. There was no weapon lying about and no witnesses in the remote, hilly section of San Francisco where he lived to give any information concerning the attempted murder. The police were more anxious than ever to find Tony Midas, the man Bennett had put the finger on earlier. The reasoning was that if he could burn down a building worth half a million to get back at Arnold Bennett, he also might shoot him. I told Andy Cord about Underwood's findings when the police car got us to the scene of the shooting. Celluloid and paraffin wick, did you say? Yeah, that's what Bill Underwood said on the phone. Well, then it would point away from Tony Midas. He was an embezzler, not an arsonist. Maybe. Who's that policeman over there? Oh, that's uh, Inspector Dickens. Well, I talked to him about it for a while. He said Midas lived in San Quentin with a man named Hanley. A professional burner. Yeah? Well, Hanley could have taught Midas a few tricks of the trade. Yeah, it's possible, Jenny. Uh, I don't know. At least Underwood is sure that he can prove it had an incendiary origin. Well, that's the first hurdle. Maybe we can't tie it to Bennett at that, Johnny, if Midas did it. Now, let's wait and see what Bennett has to say when he can talk. I think I'll get on over to the hospital. Okay. Oh, uh, here's something that came up. Yeah? Now, you said Bennett attributed everything to this Tony Midas. Mm-hmm. Well, there might have been something personal in it, too. Midas is married to Bennett's niece, Elizabeth. He's what? Yeah, she married him a month before he was convicted. Oh, well, that might explain some things. Yeah, she called me tonight and said she had some information for me about Midas. I was on my way to see her when this happened. Oh, you, you haven't talked to her yet, huh? No, no, let's see. It is 1038 Marotta Drive. I wonder if that's far from here. <laughs> no, Johnny, not far at all. This happens to be 1038, right here. Oh, well, we better tell the police about her, Andy. Andy Cord went on over to the hospital to await results on Arnold Bennett. I spoke to the inspector in charge and told him the information about Elizabeth Bennett. The police added the name to the APB already out for Tony Midas. And that's the way the case stood at midnight. 
By morning, the hospital reported that Arnold Bennett would recover from the gunshot wound. Elizabeth Bennett had not been located, nor had her husband, Tony Wattis. I always fix my own dinner. Poached egg and half and half ulcers. Her name's Dollar? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Insurance investigator. You want something, do you? Yeah. Coffee, maybe? No, thanks, Mr. Engel. Mind if I finish? Go right ahead. Well, what led you to me? The notations about the trial, Mr. Engel. You were the defense attorney for Tony Midas. We're anxious to talk to him. I defended him, yes. I don't think I'm going to be much help, Dollar. I haven't seen him since he got out. I've no idea where he is. We'll find him, Mr. Engel. And what's it all about? Well, Tony Midas has been identified as the man who started a fire in the Bennett building. Or at least who was seen in the vicinity of the building when it went up. I'm sorry to hear that. Are you, Mr. Engel? Tony Midas was a nice kid who got in a little trouble. Everything was against him at the trial. Bennett poured it on. He didn't have to, but he did. He could have let him off. You were Midas's lawyer. Did you try to talk Bennett into letting Midas off? No, I didn't. Nobody talks Arnold Bennett into anything. Oh? Tony never would admit taking the funds. He said he was framed, but he didn't have a prayer with all the evidence against him. Yeah, I read a transcript of the trial. Then you know Tony Midas pleaded not guilty in the face of everything, and he went up. I wanted him to make a guilty plea and rest on the mercy of the court. It was his first offense. Well, he's out now. And it looks like he's trying to get even with Bennett for prosecuting him. All for a lousy ten grand. Yeah. Did he ever get in touch with you? I told you, no. No phone call? No. Do you have any idea where he'd be in town, Mr. Engel? No, I don't. Okay. Then I guess I'll leave you to your eggs. Uh, Dollar. Yeah. If, uh, if you find Tony Midas, I'd like to know about it. Why, Mr. Engel? Oh, just curious. I'd like to see him. I'd like to see what five years in prison does to a kid like that. Mr. Engel, Arnold Bennett was shot in his home last night. No. That's all you have to say? What else is there to say? <laughs> well, you could have asked, is he alive or is he dead, for one thing? Suppose I don't care. <sighs> okay, he's still alive. They think he'll pull through. Who do you think shot him, Mr. Engel? I don't know. They're looking for Tony Midas for that, too. Oh, did you know Bennett's niece? Elizabeth, yes, I met her. Well, they're looking for her, too. She's married to Tony Midas. Yes, yes, I knew. I knew about that. Sit down, Mr. Engel. Oh, what is this going to be, an inquisition? That egg and that half and half doesn't interest you, no matter how much you look at it. Well, you ought to leave me alone and go find your firebug. Come on, let's have the story. I don't know any story to tell you. Was it Spite that sent Tony Midas to prison because of him and Elizabeth Bennett? No, no, they proved him a thief. I'll throw one more thing at you, Engel. Bennett wasn't always too good about paying his taxes. Now, look here. Our accounting man has him pegged. Pegged him for exactly what he is, an opportunist, a dodger. A man out to get what he can for as little as he can, no matter what. Yeah, we cover everything in a case like this. You'll never get Arnold Bennett. He's too good for you, Dollar. Too good for your insurance company, your fire investigators, everybody. No man stronger ever lived. We've already got evidence that proves the building was fired. I'm here to get all the story, and I think you're the man who can tell it. Why me? Because you work for him. I never worked for him, never. <sighs> all right, we'll let that go for now. But you can tell me this. Was Tony Midas the kind of man who'd start that fire? You can tell me if he really was an embezzler. You can tell me if he tried to kill Arnold Bennett. I can't tell you anything for a fact, Dollar. All I have is my own personal opinion. Well, that's what I want. I want that. I'd like your opinion. Now, there's something about Bennett's niece being married to Midas, isn't there? A wife can't testify against her husband. Everyone else in Bennett's office testified against Midas. She didn't. I see. Now the opinion. Oh, come on, Engel. Come on. You're right, Dollar. I have got ideas. All of them make me sick inside. Tony Midas stood there and told me he was innocent. He said it a million times if he said it once. He said he thought Bennett was framing him. To cover up from, for income tax shortages? It's just surmise, but it fits. Midas was a green kid hired into the company by Bennett. He might have been hired to be framed on a phony embezzling charge that would give Bennett a good excuse on his taxes for a while. I've, I've been fooled a lot of times. Did Tony Midas fool you? I don't know. I wish I could have gotten him off. I tried, Dollar. Believe me, I tried to get him off. You come here to me and say he's out of prison now and getting even. He's burnt down a building and tried to murder Arnold Bennett. Tony was a nice boy, Dollar. But now his whole life's gone, and for what? I hope you don't find him or her. I hope they go far away and stay away and don't have to talk to anybody ever. They deserve that. I hope nobody ever finds him. But we did find Tony Midas. He was right under our noses all the time. When I got back to the hotel, there was a message for me to get down to the county hospital. Cord was waiting for me there. They took us downstairs, and then we were both standing in a room looking at Tony Midas. Before they took him across the hall to the morgue. 
funny thing, Johnny. There's been an alarm out on this guy for 36 hours. Everybody's been looking everywhere for him, and he turns up right here. Only he's dead. Yeah. What killed him? TB. He had it awful bad, I'm saying, Quentin. It's in the sick ward his last two years. When his time was up last week, he made them release him. But he wound up here and died in this hospital. It's rough. He's just a kid. Yeah. <laughs> Up until that time, there had been some kind of a case against Tony Midas. But obviously, since he had been dead almost two days, it was impossible to connect him with the attempt on Arnold Bennett's life and the firing of the building. So we were right back where we started from, trying to make a case against Arnold Bennett, who still lay in his hospital room and refused to talk to anybody who came near him. All right, Johnny, now what? Uh, Bennett's going to be hard. We're going to have to work around him. His niece is the best opening I can think of. Uh, where is she? Police haven't located her yet. Uh, Not a trace. Andy, she had some information for me when she called last night. I still want to get Hi, it. If I... oh, oh, hello, Bill. We got a break. George Foley's in town. Who's that? Best celluloid and wick man in the country. If you happen to want a building burnt down, one of the policemen at the hospital spotted him in the lobby trying to see Arnold Bennett. Not entire, Johnny. Where is he now? They followed him to an address on Barengo Street. They aren't going to move in until we decide something. <laughs> Twelve minutes later, Andy Cord, Bill Underwood, and I were standing in front of a decrepit-looking boarding house on Barengo Street talking to the three policemen from the San Francisco Police Department. Dollar? Underwood? Hi. Hey, uh, what's the story, officer? Well, the way we see it, Foley's still trying to get part of his money for burning the building. He took a chance coming to the hospital tonight to see Bennett. No kidding. He'll probably make another try. Uh, you boys have more at stake here than anybody. If you want to talk to him, try to make a deal with him to turn on Bennett. Now's the time. Now, what do you say, Johnny? Oh, wait a minute. We aren't sure of anything about him. Well, he fills the bill, Johnny. Paraffin and wick jobs are few and far between. With nothing more than that, I'd stake my rep on fully being our boy. For what it's worth, all three witnesses now pick his picture instead of Midas. Oh, well, a good defense attorney. Get that thrown right out. What do you want to do? Oh, um, well, let's shake him up a bit, okay? Go ahead. We'll be covering the back and front. Come on. Watch out, Andy. All right, all right. That's enough. That's enough. You okay, Bill? Andy? Okay. All right, tough boy. Get on your feet and let's get out of here. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, we have an arsonist right in the palm of our hands with very surprising results. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And from February 21st, 1956, yours truly, Johnny Dollar on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Visit my webpage, classicradio.stream, where you can stream our shows on demand, learn more about classic radio collecting, and contact me there, classicradio.stream. Don't forget, our shows are available through iHeartRadio, Spotify, Spreaker, TuneIn, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, even the I, uh, even the uh, rather the uh, um, the uh, Amazon Music and the uh, Audible app. Just search for Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Thank this radio station. Support their advertisers and tell your friends the great radio shows are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station.